are listening to an American Free Press podcast. Joining me on the line is Steve Castellotti from the company Puzzle Box. Steve, thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Steve, I saw an article online a couple of days ago about a helicopter that can be controlled by someone's thoughts. I want to get into that in great detail in a minute or two, but before we do, for the benefit of the listeners, can you give them a little bit of background about who you are and what is Puzzle Box? Sure. My name is Steve Castellotti, and Puzzle Box is a company I formed in 2004, which started off focused on research and development, rapid prototyping, and exploring new technologies. And it wasn't long before we stumbled upon brain-computer interface, which is manipulating computer software or robots, or in this case, a toy, by using your brain waves. Typically, this is used with EED technology. There are some other methods for reading what's going on inside the brain. Some of them are invasive, some are not. We're sort of focused on the ones where you can just put something on and take it off without any sort of permanent scars. And for the last three years, since about 2009, as consumer-grade EED headsets have become available, that's been our core focus. You said brain to computer interface? BCI tends to be the typical term used in the industry, yeah. Okay, BCI, and also EEG is electroencephalogram, is that right? Well done, that's the one. I think I had a couple of those. I'm not a gamer, so I guess these things are well known to gamers then, right? On the consumer side, originally gaming was the target, and that might have been a good introduction. But honestly, the fine level of control that your typical gamer would expect, say, from a joystick, is just not there. There's different ways that you can interact with a computer, and some of them are pretty close. And in fact, in the research side of things, there are ways to manipulate objects and make them go left and right and up and down and forward and backwards and all sorts of things. But with the technology available today on the consumer market, something that's reachable for people for a hundred or a couple hundred dollars, that's not yet available. You're still looking at Five figures for that sort of technology. Five figures, which is $10,000 plus. Easy, yeah. Wow. This gadget that I saw on the Mail Online website, a helicopter being controlled by someone's thoughts, what's up with that? That's basically how it worked. You think you want it to move up or down or left or right or zigzag and it does it? Not yet. The way our system works now, the Puzzle Box Orbit, we use an EEG headset from NeuroSky, a company based in San Jose. And that's a single electrode which rests on your forehead, and there's a sort of ground and reference clip that goes on your ear. And that's it. So all a EEG is, at its very essence, is a voltmeter, a very, very sensitive voltmeter. It's measuring several times a second fluctuations in voltage, and it's the difference between your temple and the ear. And what it does with that signal, it runs a mathematics on it, and it's able to analyze your brain waves. From neuroscience, we know that if your brain waves are measured in the 12 to 15 hertz range, so you have a little line that goes up and down really fast, 12 to 15 times a second, if you can find that signal in there and it's strong, it means the person's focused. Those are called beta waves. If you are sitting there and you're doing math problems in your head, like 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, what I like to do is imagine the street names from one side of the city to the next. Any sort of constant, steady thought like that is going to generate beta waves. So we can detect that with this headset, and as you're focused, we can pause that to make the helicopter fly. So with our system, you choose your flight path before you take off. Typically, you just sort of want to hover in space. And this gives you the chance to practice focusing your mind. The idea is we want to leverage a principle called neuroplasticity. In layman's terms, neurons physically migrate. They physically move to reinforce the things that you do often. So the first time you ride a bicycle, it requires your full concentration. You're trying to keep your balance and manipulate the pedals and everything else. But eventually, it becomes second nature. If you've ever driven a manual transmission in a car, the first time it's tricky because you're operating all the normal car things, but now you have to work the clutch and get the timing right and the gear shift and so forth. But eventually, you don't even have to think about it. It just happens. What's happening there is neuroplasticity is kicking in. You're doing this action repeatedly, and your brain is becoming more efficient at it. Research that actually shows that if you perform any sort of exercise, including attention exercises, if you can practice sitting down, getting focused, and holding that focus, and you can repeat those exercises again and again, over time, you can improve your ability to concentrate. You're not telling the helicopter to move up or down. You're just focusing on something. And by focusing, that allows the device to pick up a stronger signal, which is programmed into your brief flight plan. That's the one. So if you had two of them in a room, you could have races to see who's able to maintain their concentration better. If you really wanted to, you could program a flight plan so it circles around you, it sort of orbits around you, or what have you. In this instance, in the future, we're looking to do more interesting ways and do the direct flying of the helicopter. That does require different equipment. And really, the biggest challenge is you need electrodes in different places. A single sensor on the forehead is not enough to pick up all the signals you would need to do the more interesting or the more complex level of control. So we're just focused on showing how this technology works, not just the EED, but everything underneath it. And to be honest, making sure that people understand that, no, you don't fly the helicopter yourself, or at least you don't steer 
it directly. And if someone sees a technology that is a single center electrode, they should understand there's no way you're going to be able to do that. If we can get this technology out there in a responsible way and show people what is possible and explain to them the science behind what you can and what you can't do, then we've actually achieved our goal. So you could actually buy one of these gadgets. That's right. This particular headset, I think this model might have come out this year, but it's based on a chip that's been around for several years. In fact, there's several toys that have been built with this same chip inside it. One is Star Wars base, and you have a tube with a ping pong ball and a fan underneath, and when you concentrate, the fan spins and the ball floats and Yoda talks to you. <laughs> Another one is like a tug of war. You can have two people try to out concentrate or out relax one another and so on. Another measurement you can take with this particular headset is sometimes they call it meditation. I like to call it mental relaxation or maybe clarity of thought. It's basically alpha waves. It's another range on that spectrum that you're looking for a strong signal and you can understand that someone is sort of in a relaxed mental state. It's not a physical thing. It's that their mind is sort of clear and they're not sort of jumping all around back and forth. These two different measurements, this focus and this relaxation, they're not exclusive. You can have different levels of both. In fact, if you imagine someone taking a foul shot in front of a stadium full of screaming people, they would be focused on what they're about to do, but also calm and relax so that they're going to have a fluid motion be able to take that shot cleanly. That's cool stuff. It's like the Jedi mind trick stuff. There you go. These aren't the droids you're looking for. <laughs> So it says here that I guess there's an online site called Kickstarter, and you can purchase this for about 300 bucks. Is that right? Uh, we got a couple different levels. One, if you want to use your mobile phone in the process, it's about 150 bucks, and that gets you the headset, and it gets you the helicopter. And the software that we provide that connects the two together through your mobile phone is all absolutely free and open source code. It's like we give you the dish, but we give you the recipe as well. Right. And then if you don't want to use your mobile phone, we do have another one that's about, right now we're asking 250 and that includes a what we call the Puzzle Box Pyramid. It's our own custom piece of hardware. It has a computer microcontroller inside. And again, that one comes with all of the source code, the hardware schematics for the controller board, the 3D model if you want to print your own pyramid, all of the details if you want to understand how this actually works. We're giving you all of that information. And that's really the key here. The helicopter, it's fun, it's cool, it's nice to play with, but we want to get this information out in people's hands and we want to see what people build with this as well. That's cool stuff. Who's funding Puzzle Box? We're self-funded at this stage. And of course, neuroscience is probably the biggest topic that most people don't know about because the United States military and intelligence agencies are funding a lot of neuroscience projects. Do you, think right. this, do you think this has applications for the military and the intelligence agencies? I've heard of military applications of this specific technology. I've heard of it in use for drones, and I've heard it for use in security. And again, it's the same deal. You don't have a drone pilot steering by EEG, but you might have someone being monitored to make sure that they are focused over an extended period of time. So a drone pilot might go on a mission for 12 or 14 hours straight you know, flying this aircraft, and this person needs to be sitting there and focused and completely concentrating the entire time if they're going to drift over over time, you might want to swap out pilots. Same thing with like a TSA agent looking at suitcases all day. You want to make sure that they are actually paying attention to what they're doing. And I've heard of this technology being used for sniper training, and I know it's been used for the U.S. Olympic team for archery. I know there's a version of this that's used for golf as well, and it's similar to the archery style, so I can talk about that a bit more. And basically, there's a headset. It has the same chip from NeuroSky in it, and there's a little LED light sensor sort of off in your periphery. It looks like a normal golf cat, you know, a normal golf visor. Mm -hmm. And what it's doing, it's measuring your brain waves as you go along. And say you're about to take a putt, this visor has a light that will go off when you are both focused and relaxed. So it's another sort of mechanism to sort of know when the best time to take your shot is. You can control your breathing and you can do everything that's right. And if you have this little light that goes off, it's like that extra little bit that tells you, yeah, 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 this is a good time to go ahead and take the putt or to release the arrow or to take that shot. Wow. Robocop. <laughs> yeah, it really is. It's the brain, the final frontier, isn't it? Yeah, and to be honest, what's really fascinating is that we're just beginning to scratch the surface, certainly in the consumer side, of what's possible with just EEG. The cutting edge of research now is a technology called ECOG, and, or at least acronym is ECOG, and that is electrodes implanted directly in the brain. And that's a long ways out from being something that people are going to go to the office and come back learning Kung Fu. But even with EEG, even with just putting on a cap and some electrodes and so forth, there's technology that's been available for years that hasn't hit the consumer market yet. And that's really where we're focused. For example, there is a, it's called a paradigm, different styles of, you know, using brain waves to control things. There's a paradigm called the P300. Simplest explanation, imagine you've lost your car in the parking lot and you are walking up and down rows of parked cars and your brain is going, that's a car, that's a car, that's a car, that's, oh, there's my car. And that aha moment where your brain recognizes this 
thing that's different, this thing that it's been looking for in this series of random, you know, objects. Right. That moment where the light bulb goes off over your head, there's literally a physical shift in brain potential. There's a spike in your brain waves 300 milliseconds after you see the thing. So it takes the brain about 300 milliseconds to process that car and recognize that, oh, that's my car and that's what I was looking for. So they've discovered that back in 1964. And it took another 20 years or so before they started to use this for people who are physically paralyzed, like ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, locked in syndrome. And they use the signal for a speller. And the way that it works is a grid of letters, like a full keyboard is put up on a computer screen. And the letters flash very quickly, many times a second, and they do it randomly, just like those random cars in the parking lot. And say you want to spell the word dog, you look at the letter D, and every once in a while, D will light up, and your brain goes, ah, I was looking for the D, and it just lit up, and it gets all excited, and it takes a couple seconds for every letter, so it's not very quick, but eventually the software can see, oh, every time D lights up, that D300 goes off, therefore they want D up on the screen, and up it goes, and then you look at O, and it continues. So that sort of technology that has also been used recently for lie detecting. The way that mechanism works is you have a suspect who is fitted with an EEG and they are presented with a series of photos. And there's two buttons in front of them. One says yes and one says no. And every time a photo comes up, they are supposed to hit yes, I recognize this photo, or no, I don't. And what you end up having in the stream of photos, there'll be photos of the person's house or their car or their spouse and so on. And there'll be photos of a crime scene, perhaps, or another suspect and so on. And they'll be just sort of random photos. And what they're trying to measure is does the person recognize what they see and do they hit the corresponding button? So the brain brain isn't sort of indicating whether or not they're lying. It's that decision to hit the button. So, you know, if they see a picture of their spouse and they hit yes, their brain's going to recognize the spouse, you know, 300 milliseconds after they see it, and they're going to confirm that. And now you have a baseline after a set of those photos. But if you have a crime scene and the brain goes, ah, oh, I recognize that, and they know that's the lie. Oh, man. Pretty soon we're going to be boxed in by this stuff. <laughs> There's still a ways out, and there's still a lot of controversy whether you can beat the test and so forth. There has been at least one court case where they use this technology, and I think at the end of it, it was used for a parole hearing. At the end of it, the judge said the parole is going to be denied. We didn't use the science in our judgment, but it seems valid to us. And it was sort of a halfway measure to saying, yeah, this is probably legitimate in court, but we're not going to use it in our decision. It was kind of covering the bases, I think. Fascinating stuff. Steve, anything else that you think the listeners want to know about as far as this technology is concerned? There's one more way of interaction acting with a computer of EEG that's worth knowing about, and that's sensory motor. And basically, if you're wearing a pair of headphones and the little band that goes across the top of your head, that's right over top of the sensory motor cortex. That's where everything that controls your movement is located. Right at the very top of your head, right in the center, right in the middle, there's a cluster of neurons that's responsible for your feet. So if you were to tap your feet, those neurons would light up right in the middle of the top of your head. And if you sort of draw a line just down to the right, there's a cluster of neurons responsible for your left hand because your brain's cross-wired, and just to the left, there's neurons for your right hand. What they discovered, interestingly enough, is that if you imagine moving your hands or your feet, the same neurons activate. So whether or not you actually move them or not, the same neurons are active, and this can be detected. So again, this technology was developed for people who are locked in in ALS and so forth. But what it allows you to do is you can train a mouse cursor to move right when you imagine grasping your right hand around imaginary tennis ball. You can imagine it going left and both hands for up and your feet for down and so forth. And those are one of the types of interactions that we are looking to tap into for future releases. The biggest challenge in getting that, honestly, is just making sure you have an electrode that can go through hair and ideally doesn't require gels or any sort of liquid contact so that it's a little more hygienic or a little easier to put on and take off. But with that sort of technology, then being able to fly a helicopter up, down, left, right, forward, backwards, that becomes possible. It requires a bit more training than just putting on the current headsets. It's a bit more like playing a guitar versus playing a kazoo. It's kind of like a new muscle that you have to learn how to use, but that's where this technology is headed. This neuroscience stuff is incredible. And listeners better start paying attention because this is the future, undeniably. Steve Castellotti of Puzzle Box, I want to thank you so much for the time you took out of your day explaining all this to the listeners and looking forward to having you back and talking about some more inventions. Thank you.